Hi, and welcome to Open, the show that opens the Bronx and the rest of the world to you. I'm Brittany Schuyler filling in for Kibben Aline, and today we'll update you on what's happening in and around our borough. Coming up, we'll discuss the efforts New York City Health and Hospitals is making to help younger individuals combat their mental health struggles. Then we'll discuss how one organization aims to ensure that current furniture is up to standard to avoid devastating incidents. After that, we'll sit down with the New York City Sewing Center to talk about their exciting classes and upcoming programming. And finally, we'll speak with New York's leading advocate for students who rely on public education to discuss the current state of charter schools here in the Bronx. So stay tuned, all this and much more is headed your way because we're now officially open. Hi everyone, I'm Brittany Schuyler filling in for Kibna Lean, and today is November 5th. You are now watching Open, a program that brings the Bronx and New York City straight to you. Don't forget to stay connected with us via social media at BronxNet TV. Nearly half of New York City teens have reported depressive symptoms and suicide remains the second leading cause of death in the youth. That's why earlier this year, Mayor Eric Adams, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and New York City Health and Hospitals announced Caring Transitions, a program aimed to serve youth ages 5 through 17 who are seen in the hospital after a suicide attempt or display signs of suicidal behavior. Here to tell us more is child psychiatrist for New York City Health and Hospitals, Dr. Nitin Tuteja. Doctor, thank you so much for joining us today. So, you know, to start off, tell me a little bit about Caring Transitions and what prompted the program. So Caring Transition is a, a wraparound program mm -hmm. that specifically addresses the um, problem of suicide, preventing suicide in young people who present to our emergency room or hospitals. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a unique partnership between Department of Health and Health and Hospital that this program has been developed. Mm -hmm. um, it provides um, youth and family uh, services that are very, that in helps engage them in treatment mm -hmm. uh, at the start of like their presentation in the emergency room. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, this program was launched specifically in the Bronx and in Queens. Is there any specific reason or statistics why these were the two locations that were chosen? So Bronx and Queens have traditionally suffered from underserved um, uh, mental health systems mm -hmm. and they have struggled to um, meet the needs of the local population. Mm -hmm. So both these uh, Bronx and Queens have seen an increase in uh, presentation of uh, youth with suicidal ideation in our emergency room. So this program specifically were designed to provide uh, additional support. Mm -hmm. um, and the structure of this program helps engage the families into treatment. So mm -hmm. families have struggled uh, to feel as if mental health programs understand them and what, what they're going through. So the unique nature of this program helps families engage in treatment. Mm -hmm. And you know, this program was launched or announced earlier uh, this year. It was announced in June. So can you tell us a little bit about what kind of ongoing treatment will the youth receive in this program? So this program um, has comprised of social workers, uh, peer counselors, not only for the family, but for the youth, uh, availability of psychiatrists to mm -hmm. see the patient. And this program starts as soon as the child enters the emergency room. So we, the team gets notified that a child is presented to the emergency room with suicidal ideation mm -hmm. or at risk for suicide or have attempted suicide. Uh, then one of the team members goes to the hospital to be able to interview the, the child to see if they are able to enroll the child if mm -hmm. the family is interested in services. And they help the child and family navigate the healthcare system in the first you know, the 24 hours of being in the hospital. If they are admitted, they help provide support and help, fam help families process what's happening, mm -hmm. uh, help them understand what means to be in the mental health care system mm -hmm. and what's going on with their child. Yeah. You know, I know later on in the interview, we're going to talk about how important the th uh, first 30 days are after an attempt, right? But let's talk about how crucial the first 24 hours are. And in this program in particular, what are they going to experience in the first 24 hours? 
So a lot of our families, um, you know, struggle to process and understand what's happening with their child. Uh, for some of them, this may be the first time um, the child has talked about suicide or has attempted suicide. Mm -hmm. And this is very hard for any family to process. Mm -hmm. It is hard to talk about. It is hard to understand. It can be traumatic for some families. Yeah. So um, the, the nature of this program is to help the families sort of understand and process mm -hmm. what's happening with the child, what were the next steps, and what would happen after the child leaves uh, the hospital, which is what you um, uh, suggested we're going to talk about, which is mm -hmm. an important time in uh, treatment mm -hmm. where children, and f children are particularly vulnerable to um, a repeat of a suicide attempt or at risk for suicide. So the first 24 hours is a critical time to engage families when they're really trying to make sense of what's happening with their child. Mm -hmm. You know, can you talk a little bit about why in particular these first 30 days are so important? And what are some, um, I guess we would say, um, prevention steps that we mm -hmm. would take to ensure that there isn't another admission 30 days discharge? So the, uh, the scientific literature has shown that our, um, that Children and adults both mm -hmm. uh, are at increased risk for repeated suicide attempt, 15 mm -hmm. times more than the general population within 30 days of discharge from the hospital. This mm -hmm. is a time when a child returns back to the family. The mm -hmm. families are making sense of what's happening. It is a time right. of a unique stress. Uh, and uh, children are at risk for repeat attempts during mm -hmm. this time. A um, lot of families struggle to talk about suicide to each other and uh, families tend to withdraw, not able to communicate about what's happened. Mm -hmm. So this program, our uh, hope is that it sort of provides that additional tools necessary for the child and the family mm -hmm. to be able to process and communicate up to each other, to support each other during this time. So preventing a, a relapse mm -hmm. of uh, depression, of suicidal ideation, of suicide attempts. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, Caring Transitions is they provide wraparound services. So it's not just the actual patient, it's involving the patient and their families and kind of that support system that they're gonna have the uh, post 30 days, right? So tell us what are some of the treatments or resources or tools that are provided in these wraparound services? So the uh, program consists of, uh, uh, like I mentioned, peer counselors, which mm -hmm. support not only the youth, but the family, right. social workers um, and psychiatrists and they provide initial assessments, safety mm -hmm. planning, developing skills for both the family and the youth mm -hmm. in managing these symptoms. Um, they help um, uh, provide support through groups. Mm -hmm. And the treatment happens not only at, uh, at the clinic where mm -hmm. these programs are located, which is at, at Lincoln, Jacoby, and North Central Bronx hospitals, mm -hmm. but happens in their home, could happen at school. So they provide flexible services for families and youth uh, wherever they are you know, wherever, wherever it's possible. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. You know, let's talk a little bit about the impact that it's going to have on these particular communities. You mentioned the two locations that it would be at here in the Bronx, and you mentioned Bronx and Queens because, you know, statistics show that these are some of the more underserved areas in New York City overall. So what impact do you think this is going to have on the community as a whole? So this is a pilot program, and the unique nature of this program um, sort of, uh, you know, sort of would help uh, understand and how we can provide a sort of like change our services in the future. Mm -hmm. So this program has been started, it was started at Queens at Elmhurst Hospital mm -hmm. in June. And we have enrolled about 19 um, children and families to date. Mm -hmm. And we have some, seen some initial uh, indication that this program has ha is having an impact. Mm -hmm. So our hope is that as we expand this program, this would provide uh, additional support, help families engage in traditional treatment, mm -hmm. and the lesson learns we can apply to other programs throughout the city. Mm -hmm. You know, I like that you mentioned that already you're seeing, in, not necessarily improvement, but you're seeing that the program is working. What has the feedback been like from families? I think families have particularly reported um, uh, feedback that they, they really like peer counseling services, which are peer counselors are, are uh, individuals who have lived experience mm -hmm. of mental illness themselves or have or family members who have lived experience of caring for somebody with uh, mental illness right. and families find these resources incredibly helpful mm -hmm. they're able to talk to families in a way that therapists sometimes struggle to mm -hmm. and they find uh, a voice that helps families communicate to their providers mm -hmm. so our uh, families have found uh, both these services and the nature of this program the way mm -hmm. the team is structured quite helpful 
you know, I think that's really important because sometimes it's not as easy to talk to somebody who has not been in that situation, who hasn't been in their shoes. So I do think the peer counseling is a really crucial element. And I do, you know, see that that is something that is going to be the most um, receptive. And so with that, New York City Health and Hospitals serves everyone regardless of immigration status or ability to pay. So how does this open access impact the reach and effectiveness of the Caring Transitions program? We want this program to be available to all New Yorkers. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important that um, things like insurance status, whether we take the insurance, we don't take the insurance, immigration status, all those things, barriers don't exist for mm -hmm. uh, children and family who come to our hospital and, and seek care. Mm -hmm. uh, and this program will ensure that these families who, who actually traditionally have struggled to seek care get connected. Mm -hmm. Because this program will make sure that these uh, families are, get, are seeing providers mm -hmm. and uh, break down these barriers which have uh, impacted, really impacted mm -hmm. our families uh, for mental health treatment and um, mental illness. Yeah, absolutely. And you know, going back to being in the Bronx specifically and in this community, you know, you just mentioned the, the financial burden sometimes that medical bills come with and, and immigration status. So tell me, what are some unique challenges do you see in addressing youth suicide prevention here in the Bronx? I think particularly in the Bronx, much like Queens in a way, mm -hmm. that um, one of the biggest issues is access to care, access to good care. Mm -hmm. uh, and also providing not only like this program serves one purpose, which is preventing suicide when it is kids are thinking about suicide or have mm -hmm. attempted suicide. And this is one aspect of treatment. We also want to be able to catch children or like you get families into treatment before this happens. Mm -hmm. um, Health and Hospital is partnering with schools mm -hmm. to be able to provide a therapist in the school so children can engage in therapy and treatment early on. Mm -hmm. Uh, and this is a concerted effort by Health and Hospital and by the city to be able to engage these children. So um, I think Jacoby, much like uh, other parts of Queens, parts of Brooklyn, have struggled mm -hmm. uh, to get this good quality care. Yeah. yeah. You know, can you expand a little bit about, on your partnerships with schools in particular and how that's been beneficial so far? So Health and Hospital has partnered with 16 schools in the mm -hmm. Bronx. Um, and we are working on... Um, hiring and also um, providing treatment to young people in schools. So we want to be able to uh, engage children and families uh, at schools where they are most at, mm -hmm. where they can, where they receive education, where we can support them uh, early on. We can provide at-risk therapy. We mm -hmm. can provide therapy for children who are suffering from mental illness or, or have symptoms of anxiety and depression mm -hmm. uh, and support them through the education and also engage families. Um, mm -hmm. Because access to treatment, and it's, it's hard for families to come to take time off from work, um, to come to clinics. I think school provides a perfect medium where this can happen. And in partnership with other, sc other uh, school uh, members like school counselors, uh, uh, existing social workers. Yeah, and is this a K through 12 in all schools or is this high school, middle school, what's the age range? Um, we have these programs open for all, you know, depending upon the school, it's available for high school, middle school, and elementary school kids. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. That's amazing. Doctor, I want to thank you again so much for sitting down with us. Thank you. For more information, you can visit nychealthandhospitals.org. Don't go away. We'll be back with more open right after this. 19.7% of Bronx sites currently experience food insecurity. Meanwhile, instead of these nice, colorful foods, this is the best food that they have access to. If this sounds like you, there are a bunch of resources to get healthy food for free or cheap. If you want to help, you might consider donating or volunteering in one of these places. Community fridges like this one are all over the city and allow New Yorkers to conveniently donate extra food to people who might need it. Go to this link and find your nearest one. Food banks and pop-up events like these provide millions of healthy meals to families in need. These organizations are distributing meals to Bronx sites as we speak and are always accepting donations and volunteers. What's up, creative family? Discover your voice with BronxNet Community Media Classes. Are you ready to bring your ideas to life? At BronxNet, we offer television production classes for community members ages 18 and over, empowering you to share your vision with the world. 
get certified in field production, in studio production, and our new exciting addition, podcast production. Once certified, you can create your own show to air on one of our six TV channels. It all starts with our free Unleash Your Ideas Masterclass, designed to help you plan your show idea and set you up for success on your production journey. This class is offered at the beginning of each month for your convenience. Our dedicated BronxNet team is here to support, encourage, and uplift you every step of the way. Join us and become a part of the creative force that engages and inspires the Bronx community and beyond. Sign up today and start your media journey with BronxNet. Visit bronxnet.org forward slash education to learn more and register. Let's create something amazing together. Welcome back. On September 1st, 2023, the Sturdy Act became law. Supported by parents and consumer advocates, it focuses on child safety by protecting children from tipping dressers. Following the act's implementation, Consumer Reports conducted and released the results of its furniture tip-over tests for various popular dressers. However, Consumer Reports discovered that the dressers manufactured before the Sturdy Act are still being sold, which may pose safety risks related to tip-over incidents. Gabe Knight, a senior policy analyst for Consumer Reports, joins me to discuss this issue. Gabe, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. So to start off, let's talk about what were some of the changes implemented by the Sturdy Act that affected the stability of dressers manufactured after September 1st. To address furniture tipovers that have killed hundreds of children since 2000, the Sturdy Act requires that all dressers under the rule that are made after September 1st, 2023, meet strong mandatory stability standards so that they resist tipping over. These federal standards, importantly, simulate real world use, including accounting for multiple drawers open at once, placement on carpet, and the force a young child can apply while hanging or climbing a dresser. And, you know, in the consumer, uh, in this consumer report study, how many dressers were tested and what was the outcome of those tests regarding safety? Consumer Reports has tested dozens of dressers over the years. In this most recent round of testing, we bought 19 popular models. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that all 10 of the dressers that we were able to confirm were made after September 1st, 2023, past our tip over tests. However, for two dressers, we weren't able to confirm the manufacturing date despite repeated attempts to contact the manufacturers. And both of those failed our tests. Mm -hmm. We also purchased seven more dressers, but we had to return them untested because we confirmed they were made before September 1st, 2023. Mm -hmm. And so what is essentially the standard to, to reach in that manufacturers should be meeting? So any dresser that is made after September 1st, 2023, which is when the Sturdy Act took effect, is going to meet very strong stability standards. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, any dresser made before that is not going to meet mandatory stability standards. Those have not been tested um, mm -hmm. by rigorous safety testing, and they can be prone to tipping over, which puts children at risk. And when looking for a dresser, what are some things that parents should be looking for in order to make sure that they reach the standards and stability standards? Are there any key visual elements that they should be looking for? So you cannot actually tell if a dresser is safe just by looking at it. Even heavy, expensive dressers can be prone to tipping over. They can be mm -hmm. unstable. So confirming a manufacturing date is key. Um, so, and if you can't find that date readily available, we recommend that you reach out to the manufacturer and retailer to confirm that the dresser was made after September 1st, 2023. Okay. And so what advocacy efforts specifically were involved in the development and implementation of the Sturdy Act? Addressing tip overs uh, has been a priority of Consumer Reports for many years. We've done comparative testing of dressers, um, and for years we've worked with parent advocates who have all lost their children to tip overs. And together with those parents, we directly engaged the furniture industry, and we fought, fought for years to pass the Sturdy Act in Congress. Uh, the bill was introduced a number of times before it finally passed at the end of uh, 2022, and shortly thereafter was signed into law by the president. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, a big thing now, and it's even my favorite, is online shopping. It's so convenient. It's so easy. You get things delivered to your door. You're not worrying about the hassle of traveling and, and just bringing stuff with you. 
However, Consumer Reports does encourage in-store shopping for dressers and for and for you know more hardware house appliances how come well unfortunately many companies with furniture listings don't readily provide the manufacturing date information to consumers it can be very difficult to find and sometimes furniture companies can be slow to respond to inquiries but if you shop in person you can ask the salesperson directly to confirm that a dresser was made after these rules took effect um, we do know that's not realistic for everyone. A lot of people do shop online. So in the interest of child safety, Consumer Reports has called on retailers and online platforms to commit to a public timeline by which they will only sell dressers that pass the tip over test required by the Sturdy Act. I think that's really important because it's funny when you think about online shopping, you think all the information should be right there in the description. So for Absolutely. a manufacturing date not to be there, I think is really important. And you know, it's things like this that is like, it might actually be worth the trip to go in person in, instead of online, you know. But uh, with that, what is the significance of the anchor kit that comes with dressers sold under the Sturdy Act? First of all, can you explain what that is for our viewers and then the significance of it? Sure. The Sturdy Act requires that all dressers covered under the rule be sold with an anchoring kit. And that is something that is going to attach to the dresser and attach to the wall to keep that dresser from tipping over. Um, this is sometimes called an anti-tip device, and it is required to come with your furniture. So make sure that your dresser does come with one and use it. We also recommend that if you have an older dresser, you make sure to anchor that to the wall as well. Mm -hmm. So even dressers that are manufactured before the date, they still qualify in a sense with, with the anchor kit and they're able to bolt it into their walls. Yes, Consumer Reports always recommends anchoring large pieces of furniture. And that includes TV stands, bookshelves, and other freestanding furniture, because these also pose tip over, tip over risks. In June of this year, the Consumer Product Safety Commission issued a recall of a bookcase, which unfortunately tipped over and tragically killed a four-year-old child. Mm -hmm. You know, so with that, is there any, is there any specific place they should be looking for an anchoring kit? Is, are there anything they should look for in the kit to ensure it's, you know, a safer one? Is there anything like that? So if something looks flimsy to you, go ahead and buy one. Um, you know, they're readily available mm -hmm. on a number of websites. Um, so you just want to make sure that you anchor in two places and that you're using something that looks sturdy, looks like it's going to hold up the furniture. And if you weren't sure how to properly anchor furniture, if you have any questions, Consumer Reports has a step-by-step -step video tutorial available on CR.org. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And so you just mentioned earlier that bookshelves are also something that could potentially tip over. Are there any, you know, household devices or appliances that we don't think of on a daily basis that could tip over? Are there anything that we don't think of that could pose safety risks? Certainly TVs often tip over and those can cause serious injuries as well. Not just the TVs, as I mentioned, the TV stands, mm -hmm. bookshelves, anything that's really freestanding um, that could pose a tip over risk should be securely anchored. Mm -hmm. And so what resources does Consumer Reports provide to help consumers properly anchor their furniture? We certainly advise consumers to check out our articles on furniture testing so you can know how dressers fared. We also just published a story on anchoring, which, which we evaluate various types of anchors that we tested firsthand. And if you have any questions about how to properly anchor, if you're not sure about the steps, we do have that video tutorial available on CR.org. Mm -hmm. And recently, since the Sturdy Act has been passed, you know, what has the feedback been like from families? Have you heard of any stories, any recounts? What has that been like? So families are absolutely encouraged, especially because our tests showed that this rule is working. Mm -hmm. Furniture that is made after that effective date is holding up to our rigorous tests. Unfortunately, of course, Countless dressers that don't meet strong standards remain in homes across the country. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, retailers sometimes do, often do, uh, continue to sell dressers that do not meet these furniture standards. Mm -hmm. um, so in the interest of child safety, we are calling on them to commit to a public timeline to sell only compliant furniture with mm -hmm. the Sturdy Act. And, you know, for families who may have furniture in their homes that's been before the Sturdy Act date, 
is there anything in particular that they should watch out for, you know, maybe feel around, you know, I know you mentioned that there were no necessarily visual elements, but is there anything in particular that they should look out for? I would just say if in doubt, anchor your furniture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so with that, you also mentioned the story of a four year old who unfortunately um, passed away. Why necessarily speak about furniture in particular? Well, furniture is in everyone's homes. It's not a risk you think about. It's kind of a mm -hmm. hidden hazard. We'd like to think that the things we have in our home have been tested for safety, but that's not necessarily the case. And that's not the case with dressers. So that just really underscores the importance of being vigilant, knowing that any dressers built before this effective date do not meet federal safety standards. And mm -hmm. so anything that can pose a tip over risk to a young child that can trap them underneath, it's of the most vital importance that you anchor it. Mm -hmm. And for our viewers who may, you know, not necessarily be aware about furniture and its tip over risks, why does furniture, is it because the furniture is so heavy, because children tend to climb on it, because it's built a certain way that's not always sturdy in the floor? I know I actually have a dresser in my home where it's not, you know, the whole thing isn't like flat on the floor. There, there There's a lift in it. So, is, is it technically a natural disaster kind of issue? What kind of issue is it that pose these risks? It's going to vary depending on the type of the dresser. There are certain things that manufacturers can do to make their dressers more stable. They can add weight to the back. They can do an interlock system. There's many ways to make furniture more stable. It's really up to the manufacturer how they want to meet these strong standards. Mm -hmm. And you know, if a parent is a victim to tip over um, incidents, where should they go to kind of help address this and maybe get some from additional help? The parent advocates that we've worked closely with over the years are part of a nonprofit called Parents Against Tip Overs or PAT. Okay. Um, if this is something that you've suffered, we encourage you to reach out to the parents of Parents Against Tip Overs, PAT, and also report any incidents, any incidents of falling furniture, unstable furniture, um, whether it was a close call or not to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. That's actually very interesting. I wouldn't necessarily that think that there's an entire group that you could go to for this specific um, issue, but for people who may not know, where can they go to kind of help get more information and kind of keep that in their back pocket? So the Consumer Product Safety Informa uh, Commission has a lot of information on anchoring. They also, um, we want to encourage parents, if you do have an incident, reach out to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, to let them know what happened. And as a support, if you just need parents to talk to, please do reach out to the parents at Parents Against Tip Overs. Awesome, Gabe. I want to thank you so much again for joining us today and sharing information with us on this issue. Thank you so much for having me. To find out more, visit consumerreports.org. Stay tuned. We have more open for you right after this. Hey, creative family, my name is Timothy Coleman, and I'm the director of education here at BronxNet. And I'm standing in BronxNet's media and technology studios in the South Bronx, because I want to let you know about an amazing program that we're bringing back that highlights the creativity of community members just like you. Emerging Media Makers is a show that introduces you to BronxNet certified producers. They've taken a step in their creative journey by enrolling in BronxNet's media training classes. On this show, you'll get to see the many ways that our certified producers have created a space that's all their own. Emerging Media Makers, your passion lives here.
Welcome back. The New York Sewing Center provides a wide range of sewing and design classes, along with private one-on-one -on -one lessons for both children and adults. Their course offerings include Sewing 101, Pattern Making, Crochet and Jacket Making, and more. One of their most popular classes is the Sip and Sew, oh yes please, <laughs> designed for beginners age 21 and older. Christine Frailing, the founder and CEO of the New York Sewing Center, joins me to, for a discussion about their programs. Christine, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. So as a founder and CEO, what inspired the creation of the Sewing Center? I have been sewing my entire life. Mm -hmm. I learned when I was a child, when I was eight years old, from my great aunt. Um, I pursued a, a career in fashion design in mm -hmm. the industry, and I always just wanted to go back to working with my hands, sewing, and I realized that, you know, I could teach others to mm -hmm. do this, and it kind of just grew over time into what it is now. Mm -hmm. um, initially, it started out with a few, uh, a few women in my basement uh, mm -hmm. sewing things together and private lessons with maybe children here or there, and then it grew into to now being lots of teachers, lots mm -hmm. of different classrooms. And how has your um, experience in the New York City fashion scene, how has that influenced the way you teach and just the overall want to teach beginners? Absolutely. I've, I, you know, I've been a fashion designer for years mm -hmm. and any time that I do come up with a class or a style of class, I find that students really want to make something that they're proud of, they want to wear. Um, there's always been the sewing classes that we had in school where maybe you made something mm -hmm. and then you didn't really wear it, right? Or <laughs> it, it, it didn't fit you right. So. All of the classes are very fashion focused, meaning mm -hmm. um, everything is really well thought out. What will people love to wear? What would mm -hmm. somebody love to walk away with? So all of the classes from my background of being a fashion designer and working in that industry, they're all, that's coming into all of the classes. Mm -hmm. I feel like you're taking me back to when I was in middle <laughs> school and I did, I loved fashion design. Like that was, I liked to sit there with little sketchbooks and even like did classes in middle school. It was never good, you know, but like you're proud of the work and it's fun to do, you know? Yeah. So what are some of the classes that you offer for both children and adults? So we offer children starting at the age of seven um, all the way to 18 years old. We have different groups. Um, mm -hmm. Fashion design, you know, we, we do fashion camps all summer long. Uh, learn how to create create your own wardrobe through mm -hmm. learning to sew for the first time, which is extremely rewarding for a child. It's extremely mm -hmm. rewarding for an adult to do the right. same. Uh, so we do actually have a couple of the same classes, but they're grouped together for children. So mm -hmm. one of our most popular classes is our Sewing 101 course. It's learning to use the sewing machine for the very first time, and mm -hmm. then you're learning to use a commercial pattern to make a pair of pants, a mm -hmm. skirt, or a, a pair of shorts. And we offer that for children starting at the age of seven and they're grouped together seven to 15 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also have that as just an adult class as well, but yeah. kind of the same curriculum, but you know, really geared towards what a child would want to wear and make versus mm -hmm. what uh, an adult would want to wear. That sounds so much fun. I'm immediately picturing like Gossip Girl. And then, like, <laughs> there's like the one girl that's the fashion designer. That's immediately what I'm picturing. Um, but you know, with that, why necessarily did you want to offer these classes to children, right? Because it is a different set when you're working with children versus adults. So why children? And also, what do you want them to learn beyond sewing? Absolutely. You know, I learned how to sew when I was a child. It gave mm -hmm. me extreme confidence from a very young age, being able to make something with my hands that, that, that I could then wear and show to my friends. It mm -hmm. built this sense of achievement within me that I, I kept with me throughout adulthood. Mm -hmm. It was it was a, a feeling of strong uh, accomplishment, but also so rewarding, and it was so much fun. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also an element of therapy when you're working with your hands and you're focused on something for mm -hmm. hours and you're making something. And so it's just overall, it's very good for your health mm -hmm. to, to have these sorts of hobbies, but in the main reason I really wanted to do this with children was because it was such a huge part of my childhood mm -hmm. and it really did build confidence for me and that's what I hope that it gives to all of the children that we do work with. Mm -hmm. And with the children that you've worked with, what has the reception or the feed like, feedback been like from them? They love it. You know, they, they mm -hmm. get to make, you know, a, a drawstring backpack in one yeah. of the first classes that they then wear at school. Uh, we also let them, you know, kind of update the, the tote bag with different patches and they get to personalize it themselves. Um, and then they get to make clothing that they get to wear. And, and as I mentioned, it's usually a summer camp, a fashion camp uh, mm -hmm. during the summer months. 
So they just they get to show off what they're making, and yeah. it's it's really fun for them. Some of them bring a friend along, and they make friends throughout the summer from different schools too. That sounds like so much fun. You know, I, as the creator of this yourself, how does it feel to kind of see this reaction and see this reception as it's happened over the last few years? It's it's been amazing. You know, mm -hmm. um, when I first started the business, a lot of uh, you know people kind of in my community were surprised. Who mm -hmm. who wants to take a sewing class? You know, and mm -hmm. it's grown. The hobby has grown, especially recently, mm -hmm. and it's really cool to see. It's something that I like. I said it brings so much joy to my life to sew and to have this sort of hobby. So it's really really exciting to be mm -hmm. a part of this world. Absolutely. And, you know, aside from children, you also offer the adult classes. Mm -hmm. And one of these programs being the Sip and Sew. Tell me more about this experience. <laughs> so the Sip and Sew was kind of created. Uh, my husband sells wine. He's in the mm -hmm. wine industry. And um, I've always loved to, to have, you know, a glass of wine here or there. And mm -hmm. we just kind of this kind of idea of a Sip and Sew came up. And we thought it would be a really great idea for my husband to help curate some of the wines that mm -hmm. would be, you know, fun to try. And then I would teach, you know, how to make a tote bag that could also be used as a wine tote carrying bag. Um, so it's, it's grown over time and it's mm -hmm. just a really fun class. It's a great date night. It's a great girls night. We do bachelorette parties and we do uh, corporate events that way or mm -hmm. like a group party in, the, in, in December months. And uh, it's just a really fun activity. Mm -hmm. I was just going to ask you, you know, do you do like not necessarily private events, but like more group events like bachelorettes and things like that. I just had a girls night recently. We did paint and sip for Halloween and it's so fun. And it, like I'm thinking about what you said about being therapeutic and it really, really is like you're just having a good time. You have the music going and it really is just like a good night, you know, and it's a really good idea, you know. Thank you. Yeah, we, we've done all sorts of events. We do um, hand embroidery events with okay. corporate companies. Up to 100, 100 students can be there. Mm -hmm. um, and we work with different organizations to bring kind of like a pop-up in their space. And mm -hmm. we'll teach sewing and embroidery. Uh, but we also, at the sewing center, we have huge, you know, classrooms that can fit 20 to 30 people. So we have birthday parties often. Mm -hmm. We have, you know, adult events often. It could be mm -hmm. someone's birthday or it could be, you know, a corporate group uh, from after work. They want to have a glass of wine and learn how to sew. That's so fun. And so in order to join in on the Sewing 101 classes or any of the class pattern making classes, are there any prerequisites to join? No, most of our classes are completely beginner friendly. Never touch the sewing machine in your life and you can take them. We do have a few classes, but it will tell you on our website if you need to take one of the basic classes first. But majority of our classes are open and welcome for beginners. That's awesome. And so do you have any classes that are more male centered or are they just all allowed to join in or, you know, on the same class? Yeah, you know, we've seen an increase in, in men joining the classes recently. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, you know, it's very, uh, all of the classes are kind of geared towards, you know, unisex, anybody can join. Mm -hmm. um, we do have a, a ladies night, which is the lingerie workshop, and we do um, different stuff like that. But for the, for the most part, most of our classes are just anyone can join. That's so, oh my God, that sounds like such a great time. And, you know, <laughs> Another part of this is that you can sign up for private sessions. So mm -hmm. how does somebody go about signing up and what particular lessons are covered in this course? Uh, private lessons can be anything that you want to work on, but you just want that one-on-one -on -one attention. Some people don't like to work in a group setting, you know, maybe yeah. a little bit more introverted. Mm -hmm. um, or if you just have something like, let's say you're working on a very special gown and you're at the point mm -hmm. where you can't really figure out how to finish it, mm -hmm. you could set up a one-on-one -on -one appointment. Um, but we also do a lot of one-on-one -on -one appointments with children as well, mm -hmm. um, that they have like a specific goal in mind and we can work with them individually. You can just mm -hmm. uh, sign up through our website for those. Yeah. I like that you mentioned if you're working on a gown. So do people also come in and work on more long form projects other than just like a one and done, maybe like the bag and the skirt that we were talking about? Do they also work with you on longer form designs? Absolutely. We we just finished a wedding dress um, that was absolutely stunning. That took months mm -hmm. and months to finish. Mm -hmm. um, and th that was a one on one um, lesson for that for that mm -hmm. dress. but. Y yes, we have, you know, fashion designers, we have artists come in that might have a specific project in mind and they're not sure how to sew and, and we'll help them make that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, you know, what is it like to maybe have the kids and adults learning together? Or what are the differences in teaching the two? It's actually funny. Kids are a little bit more fearless than adults, <laughs> you know. We've been trained as adults to kind of 
remind ourselves of yes. something and double check and kids are just they're they're very fast learners so um, you know that's the only real difference is like sometimes there's a little bit more hesitation with adults and kids are just more eager to just jump right in but um, yeah kids take a little bit um, you know you have to make sure that you're really uh, thinking about safety when it comes to children and adults but mm -hmm. with the children we, we have a couple of procedures in place just to make sure that everything runs really smoothly yeah I feel like when you work with kids, there, there is, like, you have to, like, set a few more guidelines, a few more rules just to make sure everything is safe, especially when you're working with sewing machines and exactly. needles and, and things like that, you know. But also, let's talk about any upcoming events that might be happening or workshops. The holidays are around the corner, so do you offer any holiday-themed events? Absolutely. We have a holiday ornament uh, embroidering, uh, embroidery class for holiday ornaments coming up. And then um, we also have a coat class right now mm -hmm. in the winter months. We teach how to make custom coats. And we also have lots of different events happening around the holiday season um, that you can book for private events. That's so much fun. And so how <laughs> can these classes empower and enhance confidence in these participants? You know, I think it's really about learning a new skill. doesn't mm -hmm. matter what age you are. Um, if you're taking time for yourself and you're focused on learning something new, it's mm -hmm. going to be extremely inspiring and you're going to feel really good about yourself and it's going to give you a lot of confidence. And so just to wrap up, tell us a little bit about your clothing business in particular. So I no longer have my clothing business. Oh. It was kind of a stepping, you know, stepping stone for this business. Okay. Um, but when I did have it, I um, had a, a vest company that, you know, sold, we sold vests to over 25 different boutiques. Um, all over the world and it was uh, a very fun time in my life um, but at the time I was also starting the New York Sewing Center and I just decided this was more of my passion. That's amazing. Well Christine thank you so much for for sharing with us today. I'm definitely gonna have to you know get some girls together and take a fun sewing class. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. To stay up to date with the latest information follow the New York Sewing Center on Instagram. We have to take a quick break. We'll be back with more Open after this. Drug dealer, and I'll be your sub today. Can you see anything different as a pill? No, no. You don't know? Fentanyl is being mixed into everything now. There's only one thing that will save somebody's life that is naloxone nasal spray. Fentanyl is cheap, it's potent, and it's profitable. Why would drug dealers put a lethal dose of fentanyl in drugs if they know it's so harmful? Really just all about the money. I just didn't realize that one pill could change your whole life. More kitchen now. Welcome back. Students First NY is New York's leading advocate for students who rely on public education to acquire the skills necessary for success. The organization is dedicated to creating a system that guarantees a quality teacher in every classroom while prioritizing the needs of New York City students. Executive Director for Students First NY, Crystal McQueen-Taylor, joins me to discuss their efforts. Crystal, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Let's talk about Students First NY and its overall mission. 
Yeah, so as you mentioned, we are an advocacy organization. Mm -hmm. um, and our main goal is to ensure that all New York City students have a high quality public, uh, public school, um, particularly in their community, whether that school is a district school or a charter school. Mm -hmm. And we work to support and enact policies that enable that to happen. Mm -hmm. And that really puts students at the center of those policy decisions. And what was the inspiration behind the organization? Well, you know, there's a, education is often a really complicated topic, um, and there are a lot of inputs that mm -hmm. go into the the decisions, the regulations, the laws that regulate education. Mm -hmm. um, and oftentimes, the people who are really at the center of the decisions that are being made, the kids, the students, and their families are often lost um, because there are a lot of different inputs and a lot of different stakeholders who are at the table mm -hmm. um, in making those decisions. Um, and as students first, we really wanted to recenter kids. Yeah. We wanted to recenter the idea that all kids deserve to have a really high quality um, education. Um, and who are the best advocates for that often? It's their parents. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm a mom and I would do anything for my son. Um, mm -hmm. And one of the biggest decisions that I made for him is finding a high quality school for him. And yeah. so working with parents um, to organize um, themselves and to advocate for policies that are going to put their kids at the center mm -hmm. is really why we started the organization. I feel like I can talk education all day long and just in terms of um, you know, a lot of times what the kids aren't getting. And as somebody who went to public school myself, you experience it and then the older you get and then you kind of look back and it's like, wow, it, it unfortunately, it's not always getting better, right? Yeah. And, you, and you look back at the state of that. So what are some specific policies that Students First NY advocates to ensure quality teachers in every classroom? So we have advocated for a wide slate of mm -hmm. policies that not only focus on teachers, but just focus on high quality access. Mm -hmm. um, and so most recently, we have done a lot of work around advocating in support of charter schools. Okay. Um, charter schools are public schools um, mm -hmm. that are under a different governance model. Yeah. And um, many parents, over 160,000 of them across New York City, are choosing charter schools for their kids. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have fought to ensure that charter schools can get access to um, equitable funding um, mm -hmm. for our kids, that um, charter schools are able to actually open when there's mm -hmm. demand from families um, across the city. But we've also advocated for other things like making sure that generally that there are enough resources that are going towards public education right. um, and to ensure that there are strong governance structures um, across New York City um, to make sure that teachers and school leaders can really focus on the job at hand, which is educating our kids. Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned that the governance of charter schools is different from pu public schools. Can you explain how so? Yeah. So. Um, charter schools, as I mentioned, they are public schools, um, but whereas public district schools are managed by um, New York City Public Schools, it was mm -hmm. formerly called the New York City Department of Education, yeah. um, charter schools are managed either by independent entities um, that are consist of a board um, who basically gets a charter from a charter authorizer. Mm -hmm. um, and in New York State, there have been three charter authorizers, mm -hmm. um, the New York City Department of Education, the SUNY Charter Schools Institute, and then the the New York State Education Department. Um, and basically a charter is an agreement to meet a specific set of metrics um, mm -hmm. and outcomes to deliver um, for a community and for a set of kids. Mm -hmm. um, and that board is responsible for making sure that the school is actually um, executing and meeting the requirements of that charter. Mm -hmm. And so if we're talking about today, what does the state of charter schools look like? So I'll speak specifically about charter schools in the Bronx. Mm -hmm. So um, in the Bronx, 22% of public school students attend a public charter school. Mm -hmm. um, there are 97 charter schools across the Bronx. Um, and those charter schools are performing extremely well, um, often outpacing schools that are in their um, home districts. Mm -hmm. um, and families ha are increasingly choosing charter schools in the Bronx. Um, since the pandemic, so since 2020, um, charter school enrollment has increased 19% um, mm -hmm. since then, um, up to this school year. That's 
it's very it's very interesting because I've noticed myself that it's like a lot of people now are charter schools. Back when I was in school, charter schools were something you didn't necessarily hear of, and now it's really where a lot of people do turn to. And I have, you know, quite a few friends who work in charter schools, and so it's it's interesting to see just that shift. And I can understand a little bit why that shift is happening but you know for for you specifically and you mentioned your mom and yeah. a big thing for you was to make sure your son was in a decent school so why for you was a charter a better decision so ultimately parents are going to make the best decision for their child and mm -hmm. even when you are a parent you may have multiple kids and those individual kids are going to need different things mm -hmm. and a different school is going to going to put some um, supply something different for each of those kids so and also over time like kids are in school for 13 years at least mm -hmm. right and so they may need something when they're in elementary school and that may shift for middle school may shift again for high school mm -hmm. and so similar for me as a mom like mm -hmm. I actually started out as a public school teacher in the South Bronx at PS 75 in Hunts mm -hmm. Point um, and I've worked my entire career in education and mm -hmm. so I knew a bit about the ins and outs of what actually go on in our schools um, and I was just looking for a school for my son where I knew that he would be safe mm -hmm. that I felt like he'd be loved by the adults in the building and that he would be challenged um, because you know my son he's young for his grade and mm -hmm. if you leave him to his own devices he's probably not going to always choose to pick up pick up a book <laughs> um, but that's not a reason to not push him and right. give him opportunity to engage in rigorous activities so when I was looking for a pre-k for him he actually started out at um, a local school that was walking distance to our house and it was a great pre-k program mm -hmm. um, and then I actually transitioned him to a charter school um, in Brooklyn I live in Brooklyn okay. um, and he has been there since kindergarten he's mm -hmm. now in the sixth grade and the same things that I were looking for in pre-k are the same things that I was looking for for middle school like mm -hmm. I wanted a school that he would be safe mm -hmm. where he would feel at home and comfortable mm -hmm. and he would feel like he would be willing to take risks mm -hmm. that the adults would foster that kind of environment right. and that he would be really challenged academically and he would be really be pushed mm -hmm. so that he could meet his maximum potential and i think for the most part that's what parents are looking for for their kids and for some parents they're finding that in their local district school um they may be finding that in a you know, magnet school or some mm -hmm. other kind of specialized school. And for a lot of parents, they're finding that in a charter school mm -hmm. and parents should be able to have that access to that choice. I really, really like what you just said, especially that, you know, not every school is going to have what every kid needs. Yeah. And I think it's important to really be able to kind of have accessibility to look through these schools and to look through and to make sure that the school that your child is sent to is, you know, the school that's best tailored for them. Absolutely. So shifting gears a little bit, how does Students First NY plan to address the influence of special interests in public education? So the main way that we do this is really getting the people who are closest to what the impacts of the decisions that are being made about education to mm -hmm. have a seat at the table right. um, and that's really parents um, and parents are often advocates in their own right they may not mm -hmm. call themselves an advocate but when right. they're going to school they're asking for things they're they're trying to find the right resources for their kids that's mm -hmm. called advocacy um, but when parents join together they're able, often able to find a new lever of power mm -hmm. um, together to advocate for the things that they want for not just their individual child but it may be something for their school for their district or for mm -hmm. a systemic change and so we really work to make sure that parents um, that they can really harness that collective power, that they can be at tables where decisions are being made, that they can speak truth to power about what's actually happening in their schools and what are the things that are lacking, what are the things that are going well, and, and, and talking to um, the actual decision makers, the lawmakers, the mm -hmm. state senators, the assembly members who are actually making the decisions about what's actually going to happen um, in the schools in their community. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just before this, you kind of spoke about making sure that the schools are properly tailored to your kid. And, and we talked about how it's important for parents to have that access. So in what ways do Students First NY engage parents and educator in its grassroots movements? 
Yeah, so we work with over 18,000 families mm -hmm. from across New York City. Um, and our team of organizers, they're going to where families are. So mm -hmm. families are at the train station, they're outside of schools, at arrival and dismissal, um, they're at barber shops, they're at beauty salons, they're at the grocery store. Um, and that is where we're going to um, actually engage parents and tap into some of their interests that they may not know exactly what advocacy is. They may not even know exactly how decisions are made or laws are made about mm -hmm. education, but being able to arm them with that information and giving them access to other parents to actually join together, um, to actually work together to advocate for policies that they think that they need and they wanna see in their community. Mm -hmm. And another way that Students NY engages is with political leaders to influence education policy in Albany in New York City. Tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I'm glad that you brought that up. Parents are not only parents, but they're also constituents. Um, and they're also voters, which is very relevant in this season, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, we work with our parents to actually organize not only around policies but also to engage in politics like mm -hmm. there is people power their power in numbers and so when they are candidates who they think that they are going to be good um, for um, for their students they're be going to be good ed reform candidates mm -hmm. parents are actually organizing to build support for those candidates mm -hmm. um, whether they are phone banking um, mm -hmm. and talking to other family members to other parents to other neighbors in their community to talk about about what's at stake in the election or they're canvassing and knocking on doors mm -hmm. or you know handing out you know f um, materials at um, the local train station or bus stop to mm -hmm. make sure that the community is informed about what's at stake at the election who are the candidates and where do the candidates fit on mm -hmm. different sides of education issues I think that's extremely important because like you said they're not just parents but they're constituents so it also gives parents a voice and kind of gives parents the option to help choose and help make the decisions that go on in their child's schooling. So I think that's really important. Um, and so with that, what resources or support does Students First NY offer to schools and educators to help them improve their outcomes? So we partner with a variety of schools across New York City, um, mm -hmm. particularly working with charter schools, um, that if there is an issue that they want to advocate around, we help them to actually navigate the complicated system of mm -hmm. our political environment um, to get access to their local state senators, their local mm -hmm. assembly members, um, and so give them the tools to actually be able to have conversations with their local representatives about what is important to them, what are the things that they need, what are the things that they um, want, what are the aspirations that they have for their school and for their kids. Um, and so we work with schools to be able to be a conduit to connecting them to their legislators, whether mm -hmm. it's in the in-district office or going up to Albany um, mm -hmm. and rallying together or going, you know, trolling the halls of the um, legislative <laughs> office building yeah. to meet with um, their representatives. Mm -hmm. um, and we do the same with families as well. Mm -hmm. Crystal, I want to thank you so much again for sitting down with us. This was an extremely informative discussion, so thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Of course. To learn more, please go to their website at studentsfirstny.org. We've come to the end of our show today. I'd like to thank all of our guests for joining us and you, the viewers, for tuning in. If you missed any part of today's show, you can catch the Read Cable cast at 5 and 10 p.m. on Optimum Channel 67 and Verizon Fios 33 or watch anytime on the web at bronxnet.org. You can catch a brand new episode of Open with Darren Jaime on Wednesday and Rena Valentin on Friday. I'm Brittany Schuyler wishing you and your safety and wellness now and always. See you next time.